Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Hello everyone, I'm Bill Dodd and I'd like to welcome you back for the latest edition of Market Journal. We've got a lot of water to tread in this episode, so what do you say we jump right in? And kicking things off today, there's an educational opportunity coming up that you won't want to miss. The Hearman Lecture Series focuses on providing sustenance for an ever-growing world population. Their latest installment will examine Nebraska's livestock environmental footprint. Mythbusting, Cattle and Climate, a discussion on Nebraska's livestock environmental footprint, will be open for the public to attend on Monday, October 25th at 2 p.m. This lecture will feature an in-depth presentation and panel discussion with some of the top minds in the cattle industry. This will feature keynote speaker Frank Mitliner. Uh, the, the lectureship this fall is going to be around sustainability of beef production. Uh, Dr. Mitliner is uh, an air quality specialist, so he has an extension and a research appointment at the University of California in Davis, and, and uh, Dr. Mitliner is world-renowned. Really, uh, of course, works for U.S. beef producers, but, but has a global stage when it comes to issues related to sustainability and especially air quality related to beef cattle production. With global temperatures rising, it's estimated that the United States accounts for around 12% of the total global emissions. This lecture will focus on how much agriculture, specifically beef production, actually contributes to the total national emissions. Yeah, so certainly uh, we all understand climate change and the fact that uh, the globe is warming up and a lot of different factors play into that and, and certainly agriculture plays a role in that. So in the United, the United States itself uh, of total global greenhouse gas production is about 12%. Of that 12%, the U.S. Uh, agriculture footprint is about 10%. So, so 10% of U.S. global greenhouse production is related to agriculture, and about 3% of that is beef cattle production. And, and the process of fermentation in the rumen, uh, one of the end products of fermentation of carbohydrates is, is methane. And so cows eructate or they belch methane, and of course that methane then goes into the atmosphere and does create a foot print uh, relative to greenhouse gas production. While it remains a fact that cattle production does have a measurable impact on our national emissions, Dr. Mitloner will present data that suggests cattle production could actually be turned into a carbon sink. So, so interestingly, uh, when, when you think about total uh, carbon footprint of agriculture and especially beef production, Dr. Mitloner will present some information that, that suggests that in all likelihood, beef cattle probably has potential to be a carbon sink. In other words, to pull methane out of the atmosphere as part of the carbon cycle. Methane has always been around, greenhouse gas production has always been around, but in the last 100 years with the increased use of fossil fuels, where we've brought new carbon sources out of the earth and have generated methane that was not generated prior to that time, we basically overloaded all of our sinks, uh, those plants that can uh, take carbon through the carbon cycle and generate cellulose. Well, the beauty of the ruminant uh, is uh, they do indeed belch, belch methane, but, but methane uh, in about 12 year span is recycled. And so it's oxidized back into water and CO2 Plants fix that CO2, generate glucose, form cellulose that the ruminants can utilize and digest due to the fermentation of that in the rumen. Uh, and, and so they utilize a product that is in mass uh, in, in grasslands and in other crops. Uh, and they generate, a, again, a very highly uh, nu nutritious uh, product uh, that humans can't make, but certainly can utilize. And so I think, uh, I think uh, the whole discussion around the Herman Lecture will focus on that cycle and the opportunity that we have, not just in rangeland systems or in feedlot, but, but more uh, collectively looking at the entire system of beef cattle production, 
uh, and how we can help, again, offset uh, this greenhouse gas and the climate impact that greenhouse gases uh, is having in the U.S. and worldwide. To recap, myth busting, cattle and climate will be held on October 25th in the Nebraska East Union in the Great Plains Room. That's located at 1705 Arbor Drive here in Lincoln. The event will kick off with a reception at 2 p.m. Central Standard Time, followed by a lecture at 2.30. The event is free to attend and will also be available online for those who wish to view from home. If you'd like more information on the event and the panelists that will be joining Dr. Mittliner during the lecture, you can visit hermanlectures.unl.edu. And moving on to markets, and this week's WASDE report had a few surprises in store for producers. Joining me now to discuss that and more is DTN Lead Grain Market Analyst Todd Holtman. Todd, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, my pleasure. It looks like the quarterly grain stocks report compelled the USDA to make some updates to the supply and demand expectations in the October WASDE report. This was released this week. Uh, what are those numbers indicating to you and what was your overall reaction to this report? Yeah, for both corn and soybeans, the numbers were a little higher than expected when they initially came out on September 30th. For corn, it was a small uh, incremental change, uh, a bit higher, but in the case of soybeans, it was quite a surprise to the market. 256 million bushels of ending soybean stocks when many of us were expecting, you know, 150, 160 or even lower. Uh, and, and really throughout most of the year, we'd been looking at a 135 million bushel estimate. So to see that uh, uh, big increase there at the end of the year was a bit of a surprise and it's still having a bearish effect on our soybean prices today. And some big changes there for soybeans. What was the big takeaway with wheat? Well, in uh, Tuesday's report, uh, a lot of the wheat adjustments turned out to be bullish. And uh, as you mentioned, that was tipped off by the September 30th reports also. Uh, 580 million bushels of ending wheat stocks in the U.S. this year is the lowest total we've seen in 14 years. Of course, the production estimate down around 1.65 billion bushels is the lowest U.S. wheat production we've seen in 19 years. So the wheat supplies have come down dramatically, uh, and that's also true in the world numbers as well. And Todd, how are things looking around the country as harvest continues to roll along? Any projections there? Yeah, uh, I think the crop estimates that came in Tuesday from USDA are actually pretty decent estimates. They, they uh, slightly lifted the corn yield estimate. I believe it's 176 and a half now. Uh, the crop estimate really has been stuck right around that 15 billion bushel mark. And uh, I, I think that's probably where things are gonna end up when we get to the final numbers in January. Uh, for soybeans, a lot of us were expecting a little higher yield estimate in Tuesday's number, and that did come through. 51 and a half bushels an acre is the new yield. You know, uh, everything was looking quite dry and a little bit scary there midsummer, but when we got those late rains in August and September, I think it really helped some of those marginal areas and we saw improvement in that soybean number. So uh, I, I actually think these October estimates uh, for the crops are not too bad uh, as uh, compared to previous years. And uh, I think they'll probably be close to what we see in January. And while producers are dealing with harvest here in the United States, producers in Brazil are planting. Bad weather had been a thorn in the side of producers there over the last year. Uh, what are conditions been like recently? Yeah, they, they really took it on the chin on their corn crop, uh, the second corn crop at, at late season uh, last year. Since that time, it's been dry up until just recently, Brazil has started to see their rainy season start to come alive. It's looking much more favorable uh, in the country, I think, to get their planting and their new crops uh, established there. In the case of Argentina, they're a bit dry and they may be a bit afflicted by La Nina uh, later this fall. Uh, that remains to be seen, but uh, a drier Argentina is one of the effects uh, that we would expect from a La Nina condition. And the global supply chain continues to tighten. How is this predicament impacting our exports? Uh, it, it's quite a mess, and uh, there's so many aspects to it, it, it's hard to know where to start, but uh, our shipping costs are higher. It costs roughly twice as much to uh, ship corn and beans from the U.S. to China as it did at the start of this year. Of course, you hear about all kinds of uh, port congestion that they're working on trying to relieve, uh, not only here in the U.S., but different ports around the world uh, as well, uh, just a logjam of ships. 
And then of course here in the U.S. we had Hurricane Ida hit just right at the end of uh, 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 August and uh, really caused damage to some of our grain terminals on the lower Mississippi River that we're just recovering from now. So it, it's been a mess and, and uh, it's given us a slow start to our export activity in the season ahead. But uh, thankfully, thankfully, it looks like that river traffic is starting to improve again. And Todd, before we let you go, do you have any marketing or risk management advice that you'd care to impart on our viewers? Yeah, well, uh, for right now, during the harvest period, it tends to be the usual thing, and as just hang in there. Uh, overall, we try to encourage customers to make plans so they don't have to sell crops at harvest time because that does tend to be the low of the year, and I think we're going to see that again uh, this year. Typically, the better pricing opportunities come when you get that crop uh, stored away in the bins, uh, give it some time this winter, Hopefully we can get past that uh, turn of the calendar into January. And that's when you see uh, commercials starting to bid up prices a little better, typically to try to pull that grain out of storage. So if uh, you can hang on to the first of the year, I think you're gonna find some better pricing opportunity. Thanks to Todd for taking the time to join us this week. Next week, we'll be joined by Iowa State's Chad Hart. So if you have a question you'd like for me to ask him, please email us or get in touch on social media and I'll be sure to pass that question along. Moving on, and one of the leading reasons many corn producers don't graze their crop residue is the fact that they don't know any cattle producers who need it. The problem led to the creation of the Crop Residue Exchange Program. This online resource originated as a means to facilitate those type of connections and has grown more popular since its inception. This week we spoke with Mary Jernowski to discuss how the program works and why there's been an uptick in use from cattle producers seeking a grazing arrangement. Taking a look at drought conditions around the country this year, and it's plain to see that grazing conditions haven't been too favorable for many cattle producers. With very little stored forage in those areas most affected by drought, this particular weather pattern has left them looking for alternative grazing sources for their cattle this winter. That's where the Crop Residue Exchange Program can be of assistance. So there's a lot of interest in finding places that do have forage, especially forage at a reasonable price. And one of the benefits of Nebraska, as well as Iowa and the Midwest, is that we do have corn residue. And if there is people who are willing to take care of cattle, that could be a really great opportunity for some of these producers that are in drought stressed areas to have their cattle uh, maintained through the winter at a more reasonable price than what it would be for them to haul in feed and then also um, result in some extra income for uh, producers in the Midwest that would take in cattle. Right now, we tend to have probably three times the amount of traffic uh, from cattle producers looking uh, for forage than we do listings um, from people who have forage. And in particular, this year, we've seen an uptick, of course, of people looking. Um, so if you do have uh, forage available and you're willing to have somebody come and graze it, um, you know, go ahead and put it on there and you, know, you might make a connection and hopefully make a little bit of uh, money in the process. Over the years, the Crop Residue Exchange Program has evolved in several ways. For crop producers who sign up for the program, you aren't necessarily going to be responsible for the care of the cattle unless that's something you choose to do. On the other hand, cattle producers aren't limited to use of land that is strictly for crop production. Uh, the way this is set up is people who are providing cattle care can list uh, where they're going to be taking care of cattle. Uh, they can list the uh, fields and they can list anything they want to about what cattle care is provided. But also people who just want to say, hey, you can come graze this field, pay me for it and um, walk away, so to speak. That's also available on the website. So the way we've tried to set it up is that it can be multi-use. And originally it was about crop residue, hence the name. However, we have made modifications over the years so that producers can put up uh, pasture if they want to, they can put up cover crops. I mean, basically anything that they have available for grazing, uh, they can put it on the website and uh, let other uh, cattle producers know about it. If this online resource is something that you choose to use, you can be sure your information will remain private and secure, and the process will be very user-friendly. Yes, yeah, so the way the website's set up is it's, it's pretty user-friendly, but the idea is that the first screen you go to on Crop Residue Exchange is a home page where you can either click that I have forage available, so I'm a farmer or have forage, 
or I'm a cattle producer. So we'll start out with, I have forage available. Basically, you click on a button, you do have to register. Um, that registration, the only thing that it's used for is basically to allow you to come back into the site and modify the listings. For instance, if you make a connection and you don't want to list it so you don't have anybody else um, contacting you about it, you can take it down. We need you to register so that uh, you know only you can modify those things. And because it was designed for people who had particular land that they were had available for grazing, you actually have a... Um, a location on there where you bring up a Google map essentially and you can just identify the field, pasture, whatever it is um, that you have available for grazing and then you can list details about it. And those details it can be wide open. We do have some prompts like you know water availability, is it fenced, those types of things. And then uh, basically you would go ahead and you would uh, put in your contact information and your preference. So do I, would I prefer to get an email or would I prefer to get a phone uh, call? The only people who can get access to that information are people who register on the, on the cattle producer side. So they have to register and then if they're interested, they'll basically uh, click on it and it'll open up your contact info and so they can contact you. We're basically trying not to be in the middle. <laughs> um, so we often actually don't know when connections are made. We just know when something's delisted. If you've never entered an agreement like this and aren't sure how to proceed, the Crop Residue Exchange Program has you covered with helpful resources to navigate those waters. Uh, again, it can be used for any type of forage resource. And there's also on the home page, there's actually a tab called resources. And on resources, we have a couple documents. One in particular is a document that can help uh, people who maybe have never actually developed a, a rental agreement for something like crop residue. It just provides a list of questions for you to consider and to talk to the other person about so you guys can develop an agreement. Um, we do think having a written agreement is very important for any kind of uh, rental situation just because it does help uh, each party be clear on what the expectations are and, and know really what they're getting into. The Crop Residue Exchange facilitates hundreds of registered users with over 2,000 searches for available grazing resources every year. The lack of forage in many of Nebraska's surrounding states has attributed to the sharp rise in the amount of livestock producers seeking forage. Any crop producers who have forage resources available, along with any interest in generating some supplemental income, are highly encouraged to use the exchange and connect with these livestock producers. If you'd like more information, we've provided some helpful links on the Market Journal website. Next up, this past growing season has been a tough one for alfalfa growers. Drought has ravaged many parts of the state and region, so it's important to evaluate any alfalfa stands going into the winter. Nebraska Extension educator Ben Beckman says that fall is a good time to count stems and healthy plants and compare those counts to recommendations to decide now if the stand will need any attention next spring. You can get all the details and options for improving thin stands of alfalfa in the October issue of Nebraska Farmer. And it's time now for weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. Al, we've had some precipitation this week in our neck of the woods. How are things shaping up as producers are trying to wrap up their harvest season? Well, Bill, we had a really nice storm system move through the center part of the country. If you want to call it nice from a precipitation perspective, maybe if you don't like snowfall across the western part of the state, it wasn't so nice. But overall, this storm system did bring anywhere from a quarter to three quarters of an inch broad-based coverage to the southern two-thirds of the state. We've seen a little bit heavier totals in portions of southwest and the panhandle, along with some accumulating snowfall, particularly up in the northwestern corner of the state. And that was the eastward extension of some very significant snowfall across the eastern portions of Wyoming and the Black Hills regions of South Dakota. Best I could find so far is three inches up in the Harrison region, but I'm sure that there's probably some isolated pockets that receive more than that in terms of snowfall, just not reported through the co-op network. In terms of as we go forward in time, this was a nice precipitation event, probably slowed down harvest activity a couple days. We're looking at some fairly dry stretch for at least the western two-thirds of the states as we go through this next week. So I expect to see harvest activity really ramp up as we go through this latter half of this weekend. And as we look at the upper air model, the first thing I'll draw your attention to is that the trough associated with that low pressure system is now firmly entrenched over the Great Lakes. We have high pressure ridge still slowly trying to build toward the east and a trough perch in the north of western United States. So high pressure will be firmly in control this weekend. We will see a gradual warming trend as the weekend progresses from those cool 50s out west. We'll probably start to push to the 60s and 70s as we get through the weekend. High pressure firmly in control as we go into Sunday. 
basically a really nice day across the state, very light windfall, and we'll be basically at a south to southwesterly flow at the surface. No precipitation from coast to coast, basically high and dry. But as we get into Monday, now that trough starts to move into the Great Basin and tries to close off somewhat, so it'll be a little bit slow mover. Low pressure sits over the Texas Panhandle. The system is far enough to the west that we're not going to get any surface flow moving northward to cross precipitation, at least on Monday. Most of it will be out in the Great Basin region. By the time we get to Tuesday, though, this low pressure system will start to move toward northern Colorado, southern Wyoming. Low pressure over the Texas Oklahoma Panhandle will start to draw moisture and try to wrap it around this system. But the primary focus of precipitation will be over Wyoming, potentially into the southwestern corner of the Panhandle. And that will start to move out into the region as we go into Wednesday as that low pressure system slowly grinds toward the east. Be fueled by a low pressure system over the southeastern part of the state that will help to wrap moisture around. So we'll see some precipitation across the northern half of the state. If this system dives a little bit more toward the east northeast, we'll see that moisture push into eastern Nebraska about Thursday. GFS pushes that low pressure toward the south and then it will start to lift toward the northeast. So as it pushes the south, that will allow some precipitation to develop across eastern Nebraska. Once again, if this system does move farther eastward than projected, we're not going to see this precipitation. On Friday, that broad trough over the Great Lakes uh, widens out, probably start to push some cooler air into the region, so we're going to return back into the 50s and 60s across the state. But once again, nothing in the way of significant moisture. Looking a little bit farther out, 8 to 14 day forecast from next Thursday to the following Tuesday. High pressure will be in control until we get to around the 26th, so we are looking at above normal temperatures, and in terms of preci precipitation with that high pressure system, drier than normal conditions. Look out for the end of the month, GFS is advertising a fairly strong system coming into the central United States. Thanks, Al. Finally today, producers continue to log long hours in the field harvesting their crops, but as I've been told before, farmers don't work in terms of hours, they work in terms of acres. That kind of mindset can get numerous things accomplished in a small amount of time. However, sometimes working in terms of acres can make it harder to keep track of your hours. When that happens, you could be missing out on a good amount of sleep. I recently caught up with Dr. Susan Harris this year at Husker Harvest Days to discuss the importance of getting a good night's sleep during the harvest season. In many cases around the state, crop producers continue to cut through their fields from morning to night. There's usually a big push to get things done, and get things done right when it comes to harvest. However, all too often that work ethic can mean missing out on a good night's sleep. Sleep is always important, but it's especially important during harvest when schedules are messed up, there is a shift work happening. Um, you know, a lot of farmers get out there and think that getting harvest complete is the most important thing, but what they're not maybe considering is that when you don't get enough sleep, you're more apt to have injuries, accidents, um, things that go wrong. And so it's really important to just take the time, take a look at the clock, make sure you're getting enough sleep in during harvest time. No matter how you look at it, your body is the most valuable asset you have. A sufficient amount of rest can help ensure that you're making the best decisions from both a managerial aspect as well as personal safety as a lack of sleep can impair judgment, cognition, and could make you more prone to negative side effects. Most people should probably get seven to eight hours of sleep at night, and when we don't get enough sleep, that really impacts the processes in our, our brain that happen only when we sleep. It's a cleansing process. It's like getting rid of all the toxins in your brain that only happens when you sleep. So when you don't get that sleep, things build up. Um, we have mood issues, we have fatigue, we have health issues happening, so many things, but in terms of how it affects your um, klutziness, I guess you could say, it's a big factor. You're not going to be making good judgment calls when you lack sleep. Sitting in a combine or a truck all day is a big part of the job, and oddly enough, sitting all day can lead to fatigue in many cases. That's why it's important to make sure you get up and move every so often. This, along with a few other steps, can help ensure you fall asleep a bit easier when the day is finally over. Especially, so here's one that's um, kind of exclusive for farmers and ranchers and people who drive a lot or if they're doing something monotonous for a long time. And harvest is like that, you know, you're sitting and sitting and sitting and you're, you're not getting up and moving. That's a, an issue with fatigue. And here at Agribility, we talk about getting out and doing stretch breaks every hour. You should never sit more than an hour. Um, that's super important. And 
A couple of other important tips just for everyday sleep situations. Light and temperature are two of the, the most important things to pay attention to. Um, temperature meaning you should, you should cool down in the evening and you should sleep in a cool environment because your body has to cool down to sleep. And then of course it warms up during the day. And when it comes to light, super important to have a really dark room that's, that's like a cave. So it's cool and dark like a cave. And then in the morning, get that bright light into your eyes so it's gonna tell your brain, you know, stop making the melatonin, it's time to wake up now. And then in the evening, lower the lights so it's preparing your, your body for sleep. If you happen to find yourself in bed at night still struggling to fall asleep, it's time to evaluate how you're trying to fall asleep by taking a full body inventory in order to help relax those muscles you don't regularly think about. There, there's this thing called uh, taking your body inventory when you can't fall asleep and that's one of the things that really helps is you think about every place in your body that might be tense. For, for instance, if you're lying there and your, your eyes are squinted shut, you want to relax your eyes. And normally we find that most people's tongues are at the roof of their mouth. You know, and that takes some effort. And it's amazing how if you're trying to get to sleep, you remove the tongue from the roof of your mouth and just place it in the bottom of your mouth, low, you know, relax your jaw a little bit. You will feel so much more relaxed and possibly able to fall asleep better. If you've been suffering from sleep deprivation, you can find helpful advice through the Nebraska Extension's Sleepless in Nebraska program. This program features strategies for self-care related to sleep hygiene, We've taken the liberty of providing links to the program on the Market Journal website as well. And that's going to put a wrap on this week's show. Remember, if you missed a story, be sure to download the Market Journal mobile app or follow us on social media to join in on the conversation. Next week, we'll wrap up our three-part cattle care series with Mary Jernowski by discussing some things to consider when arranging your winter cattle care agreements. Plus, we'll be joined by Iowa State University's Chad Hart to get his take on the markets. We'll hope to see you right back here next time. Till then, I'm Bill Dodd. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.